because Trump was poking the bear really, really hard. I mean, people always view the Palestinian issue from obviously a naturally Western lens when we look at it, because we think about occupation and the way that it's like humiliating and people are dying and they don't have sovereignty and all that. But if you look at Palestinian discourse, especially from people like Sinwar and Hamas, the most important things to them, the things that they really, really harp on about is not things that we would normally consider. To them, it's like Al-Aqsa, right? The mosque compound in the old city of Jerusalem. Sinwar spoke about that all the time. And when he's talking about even around the Great March of Return, but also in the recent attacks, he is constantly harping on around aggression towards Al-Aqsa. And what they mean by that is Trump moving the embassy to Jerusalem. It means Trump offering, quote, the deal of the century that puts the entire old city in Israeli hands. He is very, very conscious of that. And that is like the centerpiece of his rhetoric. He cares a lot more about that than he does about checkpoints or economic inequalities or water access. Yeah, Al-Aqsa is like the number one and Trump rubbed Hamas up the wrong way in about three different uh, areas by doing that. Uh, yeah, I remember um, when I was chatting with uh, uh, Dr. Ahmed Tibi, the, I think he's the longest serving uh, Arab in the Knesset when we were down in Israel, he had brought that up too. He was like, well, that's a non-negotiable Al-Aqsa Mosque. And I'm like, what do you mean by non-negotiable? Like, we have to have sole ownership of it. And I think when I asked him, does that mean that Jews even have the right to go to the Western Wall anymore, like outside and pray? I don't think he committed to even saying that they would have that right. So it's funny because, like you said, in the West, we have this idea of, oh, well, it's important that they have 99%, 100% land swaps and guaranteed economic equality and all this stuff. But for them, it's a lot more, I don't want to say emotional, because in a way that it sounds like it's taking away from from things that they desire, but like nationalism, all these things are, they very much are emotional things. That doesn't make it bad or worse or whatever, but they're not necessarily looking for, you know, like you said, you know, the 2% interest rate loan or the, you know, 482.7 square miles of guaranteed territory. It's things like uh, the right of return to Israel uh, being preserved or things like, you know, sole control over Al-Aqsa Mosque uh, and these types of things, yeah. Yeah, and even in negotiations uh, in the 2000s, they were they're grouped up separately. There, there's like uh, real estate, which they kind of mean as practical issues, and then there's national narrative issues, and always the kind of like uncrossable red lines are on narrative issues. Everything else, people were willing to talk about, but uh, yeah, for the for the narrative issues, it was just like brick walls. Yeah, um, I think for Sinwar, the other interesting contribution that he has uh, seemed to make for Hamas is. There's this kind of trope about access of resistance forces conscripting child soldiers. It's very obvious with the Yemen and the Houthis. They do that shamelessly. Hezbollah, a little bit. With the Al-Qassam brigades, you can look through their lists of obituaries over the decades. There aren't that many people under 18 who are listed on those uh, websites. Sometimes there's like a 15-year-old thrown in or a 16, but usually they're over 18. Actually, most of them are over 20. Mm -hmm. But although they wouldn't conscript soldiers at such an early age, what Sinwar was very keen on doing was getting children, even preteens, just to get into the mood of fighting anyway. Whenever he talks about these kinds of like attacks that are going to come on uh, the Israelis and about like uh, the kind of rhetorical flourish of we're going to emerge from the belly of the earth, i.e. the tunnels, and uh, come out and uh, reclaim the land or anything else, he's always he always says our young men and women. He always talks about men and boys. He, t he very distinguishedly throws in that he wants young people involved as well. There's a very famous uh, video of him in a crowd kind of like manhandling this very reluctant looking kid who looks like he's under 10 in a combat uniform with a gun holding him up like he's Simba in The Lion King. <laughs> and the, this kid just looking really uncomfortable. So that's like a very uh, prominent thing about him is he was very adamant about getting everyone involved. And his expectation was always that if we sort of start the fire, other people will join in. That's what he wanted for Alexa Flood as well. He wanted, I think he expected a million Palestinian Israelis to rise up. And he wanted tens of thousands of them to get uh, to arm themselves with cleavers, axes or knives and just start attacking random Israelis. He made that call out as early as 2022. Mm -hmm. So that's what he expects. And obviously he was very disappointed because he went for October 7th, expecting Hezbollah and Iran and everyone else to join in the struggle. And they didn't really. Hezbollah did their bit in the north, but it wasn't a full scale attack. Iran, same thing. Houthis, same thing. So I think he's a very good indicator of how that axis of resistance 
first of all, that Hamas has never really fit that neatly into them, but also that they're just, they're not really as committed to the cause as someone like Sinwar clearly was. Yeah. Um, any closer to wrapping up this war or any statements on that at all? Or, I mean, Hamas have, so the, the headlines are like Hamas have said they're going to continue fighting. I don't even know who they mean by Hamas. The problem is, is that although Sinwar had a very unilateral form of rule, Hamas is also famously very capable of splitting off and, ident and operating independently from one another. So they could probably survive as an insurgency without a leadership structure for quite a while. The one glimmer, I guess, is that people are suggesting this next person in line might be uh, Khalid Mashal. He's probably the most spoken about potential successor now. And he has had a history of being a little bit more willing to at least appear to compromise. If you know about the 2017 charter where they say, oh, it's not, Zi it's not Jews, it's actually Zionists, right? Like that kind of, he was behind that whole operation to try and moderate the Hamas message. It didn't really compromise on their key goals. They still wanted everything from the river to the sea, but he has in the past made little hints that he's willing to at least be more practical to avoid his own people dying in thousands and thousands. I think he actually even once endorsed the prisoner's charter from Marwan Barkuti, but it's way back as 2005, 2006. So if he takes over, he will probably be a bit different from Sinwar, but different enough to call off the war from Hamas's end. I don't, it's, that's, that's a bit too hard to say. All right. Um, any other minor stories for us or? Um, it's not really a minor story, but I don't know if you've heard about what happened in the north of Gaza with the attack on Jabalia. I have not at all, no. So you might have seen Kamala Harris about four or five days ago talking about how she was going to consider restricting military aid to Israel, cutting the budget. And the reason she did that was because there was this kind of rumor going around in the early days of October this month that Israel was actually actively blocking aid from getting into the north of Gaza. Now, usually when people talk about blocking aid, when you see these little reports, they're usually talking about the fact that some aid trucks are getting arbitrarily seized and then sent to the back of a queue because they had dual use items in them. But for this particular situation, it seemed like nothing after one shipment in the 1st of October, for the next two weeks, nothing was going in. Then rumors started to spread about this major general, someone called uh, Giora Eiland, who apparently had this plan to do a proper full-on siege, not even with any aid, onto the north part of Gaza to basically put pressure on the remaining Hamas militants who had regrouped up there. Mm -hmm. And then just to be clear for people listening at home, um, things like sieges where you're sieging towns or cities or groups of people where there are civilians present, um, that's not allowed anymore. You can't do that internationally. This is always violative of the international law. You can never be cutting off civilians from receiving aid, uh, 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 you know, for like food and medical supplies. You don't, you're not obligated to keep enemies supplied with, with food and medicine, but you can't cut off civilians in any case. Sieges are not like things anymore that you're allowed to do. Yep, you can't do it. And also, even if, which this did happen, even if you do make a call for people to flee south, civilians, and even if, which also happened, the Ministry of Interior warned everyone in the north not to flee. They said it was a lie. They said there's nowhere else that's safe. Don't listen to them. Stay where you are. That happened as well. Despite that, you're still supposed to allow aid in. And what seems to be emerging, at least from a few reserve soldiers who have spoken to the press, is that the general's plan was actually being implemented, but wasn't being authorized by the general staff or uh, central command. It seems like some part of the IDF in the north was operating unilaterally and actually carrying out this thing. And as soon as that came out around October 15th or the 14th, Kogat very quickly started announcing and showing videos of 30 trucks, 50 trucks the next day going into the north through different crossings. So whatever happened there, and I think the Kogat website is still showing this, it doesn't seem to be the case that between the 1st of October and at least the 14th, nothing was going into the north. And I think that is probably the strongest case so far of a part of the IDF actually using like a siege mm -hmm. strategy with food being blocked, like full on. Yeah. Well, not good. Um, 
I guess I'm assuming Israel's announced there's going to be an investigation and maybe we'll hear about it in a year or two for that guy or? Yeah, I mean, I because that's a pretty grave violation. I think as far as violations of the uh, of international law that I've seen so far from the IDF, there are lots of them where it's like there are bits of information that could sort of make sense of this. This one, I think, is probably the worst example so far. Uh, it. There's no evidence yet. There's no evidence that it's been approved by the government or by the general staff or central command. So I don't think anyone's announced an investigation yet. But yeah, it looks like that's what can be one to look out for in terms of who actually faces consequences for that, because that's a pretty big one. Yeah. OK, uh, well, anything we should keep an eye out for in the next week before the uh, U.S. election is coming up? I mean, from the Middle East, I guess if we're keeping up the trend, maybe Netanyahu will get arrested or kicked out of office. And at that point, the only remaining leader will be Abbas, the one true survivor, supreme leader of the Holy Land. Who, that guy's, is he like 85 plus? How old is he? He's 89. 89. God damn. Yeah. That's a long time. And he's time also to, yeah. despised. If you're despised by Palestinians, you're probably going to die at some point. Yeah, right? and so, as well as, yeah I was going to say, he's hated by everybody. So, geez, well, mm -hmm. congrats for him. <laughs> he's playing the he's playing the survivor's game. No no ICC arrest warrants recommended. No airstrikes anytime soon. Mm -hmm. He's played the long game. So, All right. Well, hey, thanks for the updated information. Maybe when we do this next week, maybe we'll do it live. You can be my one live guest instead of being quasi live. So, yeah. Maybe. All right. Well, okay. thanks a lot. I'll see you later. Come on, take care. Bye. Bye-bye. Please 